The Subcommittee on Elections of the Committee on House Administration will now come to order. Uh, it's good to see all of my colleagues this morning. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, it appears that we have uh, uh, about six members on, on the call today, and just thank all of you for taking the time to log on, and we'll try to get through this as quickly as we, as we can. Uh, on the Democratic side, we have, in addition to the chair, we have Mr. Aguilar, Ms. Ledger Fernandez, uh, Ms. Scanlon, and of course, myself. Uh, on the Republican side, we have Mr. Davis. I understand that he uh, may be traveling, but he should be with us, Mr. Davis and Mr. Mr. Style. So thank all of you for, for joining. As we begin, I want to, to very briefly note that we are holding this hearing in compliance with the regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. Generally, we ask our members, our subcommittee members and witnesses to keep their microphones muted when not speaking. And of course, the purpose for this is to limit the background noise. Our members will need to unmute themselves when seeking recognition or when recognized for their five minutes. Witnesses will also need to unmute themselves when recognized for their five minutes or when answering a question. Members and witnesses, please, please keep your cameras on at all times, even if you need to step away for just a moment. Please do not leave the meeting or turn your camera off. And there are good reasons for that, so please remember that if you will. I would also like to remind members that the regulations governing remote proceedings require that we cannot participate in more than one committee proceeding at the same time. Now, I know it's tempt tempting from time to time, but that is the rule. You cannot participate in more than one committee proceeding at the same time. And so at this time, <clears throat> I'm going to ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any point and that all members will have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and have any written statements be made part of the record. Uh, if, if there are no objections, I will, I will so order it. Today's hearing is the fourth. It doesn't seem like it's been four, but this is actually the fourth in a series of hearings that this subcommittee is conducting, examining the state of voting in America. Today, we will discuss changes in election administration and voting laws that reduce or consolidate or relocate polling locations that impact the ability of voters to access the ballot. We'll talk about long wait times at the polls and restrictions on opportunities to vote, all of which, all of which can disproportionately burden minority voters. We all saw the stories of lines so long, so long voters uh, brought, let me start that one over, we all saw the stories of lines so long that voters brought chairs to wait for the opportunity to vote. Or we saw volunteers providing food and water to people who have to wait in line for hours on end. That's terrible. No voters should have to wait hours to vote. I hope we can all have bipartisan agreement on that. Others still may be forced to travel long distances to reach their polling location. Many do not have the time in their day to do either. And so we have seen the stories of Republican legislatures all across the country who are doubling down on their strategy of making voting inconvenient. Some say they're interested in making it easier to vote and harder to cheat. But what they don't tell us and what they don't tell you is that the, they only want you to vote where and when it is convenient for them. There's no proof that these laws are necessary and no analysis to ensure that they are not discriminatory. Unfortunately, the evidence reveals plainly the, the very opposite. They are discriminatory and intended to keep voters from the ballot box. I wanna have a debate about that, but that is my opinion. Expanded opportunities to vote, such as early mail-in or curbside voting and access to drop boxes increase equal access to the ballot and can decrease these waiting times. We should provide more of these opportunities. Recent elections prove that if voters are given options for when and how to cast their ballot, participation in the electoral process will actually 
increase. When we increase the opportunities available to voters, it increases participation in our democracy. Our democracy only serves the people when every voter has the ability to freely and fairly participate. The Constitution, that great document that we all serve, the Constitution is unambiguously clear. Congress has a clear role in protecting this right to vote and ensuring equal, equitable access to the franchise. And so, my friends, I look forward to hearing and learning from today's witnesses and working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to ensure we do just that. Uh, thank you for listening. I will now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Steele, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I start out nearly all of our hearings reminding folks that we saw historic turnouts in 2018 and 2020 elections. Uh, more people voted in the 2018 midterms uh, than in any midterm election. More people voted in 2020 than ever before. I say this because for years, the rhetoric, which is getting louder, uh, has been that Republicans are trying to suppress the vote. In fact, uh, it's been suggested at each hearing this subcommittee has held. Uh, it's Democrats' justification, I think, for H.R. 1, and the assertion uh, just is not true. Today's hearing uh, focuses on the effects of polling location closures. And unfortunately, in 2020, we did see polling location closures. However, it may surprise many of my colleagues that these closures were done in Democratic areas where the elections are administered largely by, wait for it, Democrats. These closures occurred to push mail-in voting without common sense safeguards. Let's review eight cities or counties where elections were administered by Democrats or Democratic appointees. In my home state of Wisconsin, the city of Milwaukee reduced polling locations from 180 to just five in the 2020 primary election. In Fulton County, Georgia, which includes the city of Atlanta and is home to 11% of the state's population, they only opened five polling locations during their primary election. Harris County, Texas, home to one of the fastest growing cities in the country, uh, Houston. Uh, voters reported waiting up to six hours to vote in the primary election due to poll closures. LA County closed more than 3,500 voting locations in its primary, reducing the county's poll locations to just 978 uh, for a county whose population is nearly double the entire state of Wisconsin. In New York City, not only were polling places reduced for the primary election, but some didn't open on time and locations were changed just hours before voters showed up to vote. Washington, D.C. went from 143 locations to just 20 for its primary. Chicago had reports of multiple polling location closures. Philadelphia County reduced polling locations by 77 percent for their June 2 primary. And admittedly, the list goes on. And so I had to ask my colleagues and in the mainstream media who's listening today, where was the outrage from Democrats? Where was the oversight hearings then? I think Democrats on this committee failed to hold hearings or conduct proper oversight. Republicans, however, sent letters, uh, oversight letters to each jurisdiction expressing concern and requesting answers. And I'd ask uh, unanimous consent to insert those letters and their responses into the record. Without objection. So further, instead of improving uh, voter confidence and addressing these issues, HR1 really would do the opposite. We'll hear from today's witnesses about how HR1 would nationalize all elections and centralize their administration in Washington, D.C. under Democratic control, who has a history of closing polling locations and removing key safeguards like voter ID or list maintenance that protect our elections and help ensure voter confidence that voters are confident and the process and the results. Last Congress, Republicans introduced legislation to help states ensure polling locations could remain open. The Emergency Assistance for Safe Elections Act, the EASE Act, would have provided additional funding to help states and localities to help poll workers disinfect equipment for voting machines, purchase personal protective equipment for poll workers and other items. The EASE Act would have also addressed an issue election administrators across the country struggle with, which is recruiting enough poll workers. The typical poll worker is 65 years or older, which is admittedly the designated at-risk population for COVID. Even outside of the pandemic, recruiting poll workers has been increasingly difficult for election administrators. The EASE Act would have provided funding to help states clean their voter registration rolls, which impact voter wait times. The more outdated the voter rolls, the longer it takes poll workers to find a voter in the system. 
there there are, I think, really common sense solutions that don't involve a federal government takeover of our election system. And unfortunately, we were not able to review the bill in this committee. Uh, and Speaker Pelosi never brought the bill uh, to the floor for a vote. I believe there are election administration solutions Democrats and Republicans can work on together. And I'm hopeful that my colleagues on the committee will take me up on addressing some of them. I look forward to today's hearing, Mr. Chairman. And with that, uh, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Stahl. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I noticed that the ranking member of the full committee is on the screen, my good friend, my neighbor, uh, Congressman Rodney Davis from the great state of Illinois. Rodney, can you share a few words with us this morning? Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it'd be great to see you again next week. I, I can't wait till we get a chance to get back in, in the hearing room to do these hearings and bring these witnesses out in person. Saw there was some updated guidance coming from the Office of Attending Physician today. I promise you, sir, I will sit way at the other end of the dais if it makes you and Mr. Aguilar feel more comfortable. But I'd love to be able to be there and share some of those great sweet potato chips that you guys have uh, in, in your office. Hey, uh, sir, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could real quick ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a copy of our House Administration Minority uh, Ballot Harvesting Report, a copy of the Election Assistance Commission data on turnout and elections, and also the correspondence that uh, we have gathered between the state of California and SKD Knickerbocker and the Election Assistance Commission on the misuse of taxpayer dollars. Without objection. Uh, thank you, sir, very much. Hey, listen, I'm really excited to look at, to listen to the witnesses here today. I certainly hope, Mr. Chair, uh, coming forward as we move these subcommittee hearings for, uh, into the future, that we might have a chance to invite some of the election administrators that we are going to talk about today. I would like to find out why certain areas of, of Georgia and Wisconsin uh, had so many poll closures. I want to know what their justifications are, what they were. Now's our time to go back and find out these answers as to why so many polling locations in majority Democrat areas were shut down before the election. I want to know what was the problem. Was it a COVID-related issue? Was it something that is related long-term to a lack of election judges? What do we need to do as a committee to show some leadership here? And I certainly I'm, I'm glad we're going to hear from a lot of educational and, and research experts today, but I do believe in the future if we could sit down and come up with a good two-panel hearing of this subcommittee for election administrators nationwide so that we can get especially those in the areas of Georgia and Wisconsin where we saw disastrous results from polling location closers. I'd love this subcommittee to be able to take that on. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back and, and thank you, Mr. Davis. And let me just assure you, Rodney, that we are just as eager as you are to return to in-person hearings, but, but we, we're just concerned. Uh, we're concerned that not all staff and not all of our members have been vaccinated, uh, but I clearly understand your concerns. And we've talked about it in our Democratic Caucus. And please know that uh, we will return to in-person uh, hearings just as soon as we can do it safely. In just a moment, I will introduce our witnesses, but before I do so, uh, as a reminder to our witnesses, each of you will be recognized for five minutes. There is a timer there on your screen. Please be sure that you can see the timer and are mindful of this five minute time limit. Your entire written statements will be made part of the record and the record will remain open for at least five days for additional materials to be submitted. And so I welcome, I welcome each of our witnesses today. Uh, joining us uh, on our first panel are Mr. Stephen Pettigrew of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Ms. Jesslyn McCurdy of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, Mr. Kevin Morris of the Brennan Center for Justice, uh, Mimi, Ms. Mimi Marziani of the Texas Civil Rights Project, and Mr. Donald Palmer, who is the chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Let me first talk about Dr. Pettigrew. Dr. Pettigrew is the director of the data sciences at the University of Pennsylvania's program on opinion research and election studies and the deputy executive director of the Fox leadership program. Prior to joining Penn, uh, Dr. Pettigrew received his PhD 
in political science and a master's in statistics from Harvard University and worked at the MIT Election Data and Science Lab. Very impressive resume. Thank you for joining us. Ms. Jessalyn McCurdy is the Interim Executive Vice President for Government Affairs at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Prior to joining the Leadership Conference, uh, Ms. McCurdy served as Deputy Political Director at the National Political Advocacy Department of the ACLU and as counsel for our House Judiciary Committee. Uh, thank you for your work over the years. Uh, Kevin Rogers, Ma Morris. Kevin Morris is a quantitative researcher with the Brennan Center for Justice's Dem Democracy Program, focusing on voting rights and elections. His research focuses on the impact of laws and policies on access to the polls. Now, Mr. Morris has a bachelor's in economics from Boston College and a master's in urban planning from NYU's Wagner School with an emphasis on quantitative methods and evaluation. Mimi Mariziani is the president of the Texas Civil Rights Project where she has served since 2016. She also teaches election law and policy at the University of Texas School of Law. Before moving to Texas, our witness spent several years as counsel for the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice, where she litigated election law cases in federal courts, including the United States Supreme Court. Finally, uh, Donald Palmer, Mr. Palmer is a commissioner uh, with the U.S. Election Assistance Commission and the commission's current chair. Uh, commissioner Palmer was confirmed by the Senate on 2 January of 2019. Prior to serving as commissioner, he served as secretary of the Virginia State Board of Election as Florida's Director of Elections, as a trial attorney with the Voting Rights Section of the Department of Justice. He served two decades in the United States Navy, and thank you, sir, for your incredible service to our country. At this time, I'm going to recognize each one of our witnesses for five minutes. We will start with Dr. Pettigrew. Dr. Pettigrew, you are now recognized, sir, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Butterfield, Ranking Member Style, and members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify here today. I'm Dr. Stephen Pettigrew from the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm here to talk about my research on the problem of long lines at polling places and the disproportionate impact that they have on voters of color. Managing the length of lines at polling places is one of the most crucial tasks that state and local election officials must handle. In 2013, the bipartisan Presidential Commission on Election Administration recommended that no voter should have to wait more than half an hour to vote. In the November 2020 election, however, approximately 16 million voters waited in line longer than this 30-minute benchmark. About 5 million waited longer than an hour. As the problem of long lines has grown in recent decades, so too has the political science literature on the topic. In my testimony today, I'd like to highlight three key findings from that research. The first finding is that non-white voters tend to face considerably longer waits to cast their ballots than white voters. This racial difference is a consistent finding in research about long lines, no matter what data or research methodology is used. In my own research, I find that all other things equal, non-white voters are three times as likely as white voters to wait more than 60 minutes, and six times as likely to wait more, I'm sorry, three times as likely to wait longer than 30 minutes and six times longer than 60 minutes to vote. Even in 2020, when average wait times were longer than any election since at least 2008, this racial gap persisted. Roughly 17% of white voters waited more than 30 minutes, compared to 23% of black voters, and one out of every 20 black voters waited longer than an hour, compared to one out of every 44 white voters. One possibility that could explain this gap um, is that non-white voters are more likely to live in urban areas and white voters in rural areas. If the logistics of elections are just harder in cities, then that could account for the racial gap in wait times. My research finds that although this is a piece of the story, the urban-rural divide accounts for less than half of the racial gap in wait times. And this leads me to the second conclusion from the political science literature, which is that the gap in wait times by race is largely driven by fewer resources, like poll workers or voting machines, being allocated to predominantly non-white polling places. Policies like precinct closures, shortening voting hours, and voter ID laws can have significant impacts on wait times, especially for non-white voters. 
In some ways, polling, lines at polling places are similar to lines at the grocery store or traffic on the highway. If there's too few cashiers or lanes, then shoppers or vehicles get backed up. And similarly, if a precinct has too few poll workers or not enough voting machines, then lines will develop. My research and that of other political scientists finds that the ratio of voters to poll workers or voters to machines tends to be more favorable in mostly white precincts. In addition to adding more resources to polling places, policymakers and election officials can influence line length in other ways. Opening new polling places that are well-staffed and well-resourced can decrease line length, while closing precincts without making dramatic changes to the unclosed ones can cause significantly longer waits. Increasing the hours of operation of polling places or the number of days of early voting can help mitigate long lines, while cutting hours has the opposite effect causing voters to show up in larger clusters, creating the potential for bottlenecks. And lastly, increasing access to vote by mail is another effective way to shorten lines by decreasing the number of voters showing up to vote in person. The third key finding from research about long lines is that they can have negative consequences on the voter and the electoral system as a whole. Lines can be a big boat burden on those who have less flexibility in their schedule because of a tight work schedule or because they have to pick up their kids at school. In my research, I found that voters who experience a long wait are significantly less likely to turn out in subsequent elections. And given that 16 million voters experienced a long wait in 2020, my research suggests that hundreds of thousands could be turned off from voting in future years. Even more than that, voters have found, researchers have found that voters who experience a long line are less confident in the integrity of the electoral system as a whole. They're less likely to believe that their ballot will be kept secret or that their votes will be properly counted. Standing in a long line to vote is perhaps one of the most common ways that voter satisfaction is eroded. It's clear from decades of research that non-white voters are significantly more likely to bear the cost of a long line than white voters. This fact is even more troubling when you consider that long lines decrease future turnout and erode voter confidence. Going forward, it's essential that when state and local election officials make changes to election procedures, they don't put their thumb on the electoral scale by widening the race gap in wait times. I wanna thank the committee for their time and for holding he hearings on this important topic of improving the health of our democracy. And I look forward to any questions that you have. Thanks. And thank you, Dr. Pettigrew. At this time, the chair will recognize Ms. McCurdy for five minutes. Chairman Butterfield, Ranking Member Style and Davis and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you, Chairman Battlefield, for your leadership in calling this hearing. It is a critically important discussion as we watch an ongoing, coordinated, and calculated attack on the foundation of our democracy, the freedom and right to vote. Last year, across race, income, and zip code, and in the face of a once-in-a-century global pandemic, Americans turned out to vote in historic numbers. It was awe-inspiring moment and a declaration of the great possibility of our nation to live up to the highest ideals. Yet in response, some politicians are trying to take us backwards by creating barriers for black, brown, and indigenous and new Americans who want to exercise this fundamental right. The path was paved for these po politicians by the US Supreme Court in 2013 when five justices eviscerated Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in, Shelby, in the Shelby County versus Holder decision. Section 5, known as the heart of the Voting Rights Act, enabled the federal government to block proposed discriminatory voting restrictions in places with pervasive histories of discrimination. It also ensured that changes to voting rules were public, transparent, and evaluated to protect voters against discrimination based on race and language. It is imperative that Congress restore preclearance given the crisis our democracy is facing now. While these discriminatory barriers take many forms, I will focus on just one today, the removal of the very locations where ballots, and, ballots are cast and counted. Polling place closures and consolidations are a pernicious and incredibly effective tactic for disenfranchising voters, particularly voters of color, older voters, rural voters, and voters with disabilities. And since the Shelby decision, jurisdictions are closing polls at alarming speed. The Leadership Conference Education Fund documented the trend in our report, Democracy Diverted, when analyzing polling place closures in 757 counties once covered under Section 5. Chairman Butterfield, I would like to enter this report into today's hearing record. All right, unless there's objection, the report is received. 
Shockingly, we found 1,688 polling places were closed between 2012 and 2018. Overall, Texas alone closed 750 polling places. Arizona closed 320, and Georgia closed 214. Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and North Carolina combined closed over 300 polls. Many of these closures are happening in communities of color rather than in majority white neighborhoods. And in many instances, officials prove, provided no notice to voters that their voting precincts were closed or relocated. Not surprisingly, Georgia closed a higher percentage of polling places than any other state in 2018. In an extreme example, local policymakers left seven counties in the state with just one polling place to serve thousands of people over hundreds of square miles. This is patently unacceptable, and particularly when voted viewed against America's persistent history of denying the vote, the right to vote to Black Americans. Before the Shelby County decision, Section 5 enabled the federal government to analyze voting changes like polling place reductions to ensure they did not discriminate against voters of color. This critical protection no longer exists, and the consequence on voters' ability to cast a ballot are devastating. No one should be deterred from casting their ballot because of location, ability to take off work, access to transportation, or responsibilities at home. Disturbingly, the attacks on our freedom to vote have only worsened following the 2020 election. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, since January, at least 14 states have enacted 22 laws that restrict the vote and put up barriers to the ballot box. Overall, state lawmakers have introduced at least 389 anti-voter bills just this year. Voters of color will bear the brunt of these new restrictions and the most significant assault on voting rights since the Jim Crow era, and we know that it is a fully functioning voting rights had been in place in the federal election could have prevented many, if not most of these attempts to silence the voices of voters, as well as any anti-voter bills that have proliferated over the last decade. The Leadership Conference urges Congress to pass the John Lewis, rights, John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. This historic bill will reverse and damage the damage done by the Supreme Court in Shelby County and update Voting Rights Act to reflect modern day patterns of voting discrimination. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you, Ms. McCurdy. At this time, the chair will recognize Mr. Morris for five minutes. Chairman Butterfield, Ranking Member Style, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today in support of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. In the eight years since the U.S. Supreme Court decided Shelby County v. Holder and suspended the 1965 Voting Rights Act preclearance condition, voters of color have had to fight harder than white voters to exercise the right central to the American project, namely their right to participate without undue burden in their own self-government at the ballot box. Election day experiences are a major source of disparities in our electoral system. Racial and ethnic minorities routinely face longer waits than white voters. The distribution of electoral resources, polling place consolidation, and voter list maintenance all put voters of color at a disadvantage on election day. Federal oversight is needed. Over the past decade, scholars and activists have documented that racial and ethnic minorities wait longer to cast their ballots on election day. My research at the Brennan Center for Justice, a nonpartisan think tank, demonstrates that voters wait longer in places where there are fewer resources available. However, this cannot explain the full racial weight gap. In 2018, voters of color did not live in counties with fewer electoral resources. This complicates our understanding of the allocation of resources, and it means we need to focus on the equitable experiences on election day, that is ending the racial weight gap, not only on an equal distribution of resources. In other words, as much attention needs to be paid to the quality of resources as to their quantity. Furthermore, while voters of color in 2018 may have lived in better resource regions, their population growth is concentrated in counties with, with fewer resources. Put differently, resource allocation patterns are on track to exacerbate, not mitigate, the racial weight gap in coming years. Nowhere do polling place resources matter more than in the number of poll sites available. A large body of empirical work has demonstrated the disenfranchising impact of polling place closures. This was thrown into sharp relief in 2020 by the COVID-19 pandemic when the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin shuttered nearly all of their polling places for the presidential primary. Just five out of more than 180 remained open. 
This last minute decision to close the polling places came against the backdrop of a surge in vote by mail usage. However, as my research demonstrates, the accessibility of vote by mail was not enough to offset large declines in turnout in the city. Rather, turnout declined by an estimated eight percentage points, or nearly a third. This negative effect was even larger for black voters. Increases in voter purges in formerly covered jurisdictions have also led to a deterioration in polling place quality. The Shelby County decision led to a dramatic increase in voter purge rates in jurisdictions formerly covered under Section 5 of the VRA. Wrongful purges can and do disenfranchise some voters, but the consequences extend even to voters whose registrations were not canceled. My research shows that increased purge rates were associated with higher provisional ballot rates in formerly covered jurisdictions. Voters spend longer filling out provisional ballots than they do ordinary ones, which can cause slowdowns for entire polling places and not just the voters who were wrongfully purged. Given that formerly covered jurisdictions were covered precisely because of their histories of racial discrimination, the ripple effects of increased provisional ballots are occurring where voters were once, but are no longer, protected by Section 5 of the VRA. It might seem that decisions about election day resources should be left up to the states and that federal intervention is unnecessary. Unfortunately, that is not the case. As my research documents, mandatory minimum resource requirements set by individual states are routinely ignored. To take just one example among many, in 2018, 31 out of South Carolina's 46 counties, that is two thirds of South Carolina's counties, had more voters per machine than allowed under state law. State regulation is not a sufficient bulwark against the under-resourcing of polling places in the states. Federal oversight, such as that promised by the VRAA and the For the People Act, is needed. Restoring the 1965 Voting Rights Act to its full power is more important today than at any point in the past eight years. So far in 2021, 48 states have introduced laws making it more difficult to vote. These have become law in 14 states so far, and the legislative session is not yet over. Bills introduced and passed in states like Georgia, Florida, and Texas would make early and mail voting less accessible, pushing more voters into polling places on election day, further straining resources, and leading to longer lines. In short, the preclearance condition of the VRA worked. It protected voters of color from discriminatory voting laws in parts of the country with discriminatory histories, and it can do so once again. Voters of color today face steeper costs in today's elections, costs paid in lost time and lost wages due to unfairly researched polling places. I urge Congress to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Morris. At this time, the chair recognizes Ms. Marziani, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If not, please excuse me. Uh, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and good morning. Um, to you, Representative Butterfield, and to Ranking Member Style, and to the other members, I'm Mimi Marziani. I'm the president of the Texas Civil Rights Act, and I'm um, very honored to be with you today. So I am here from Austin with a pretty urgent message. Since the Supreme Court Shelby County decision, there have been a slew of voting law changes in Texas that have made it more difficult for Black and Latinx Texans to vote. Texas, then, sadly, is a prime example of why Congress must act now to update and reinstate preclearance. I've provided numerous examples of the racially discriminatory voting law changes that have occurred in Texas to this committee previously. In January 2019, to the Committee of the Judiciary in May 2019, to a select subcommittee on the coronavirus in September 2020, and in the testimony submitted today, I attached those prior testimonies, but also focused on a particularly troubling trend which you've heard from my fellow panelists. And that is that in Texas, we have seen far more polling places close than in any other state. These closures have disparately impacted communities of color. Plus, Representative Style is right. These closures have occurred under Republican and Democrats, which underscores, in fact, the need for the type of federal investigation and oversight that preclearance used to provide. On top of all of that, if not for brave pro-voting rights lawmakers breaking quorum before our regular legislative session ended on May 31st of this year, Texas would have a new law further restricting access. The fight is far from over. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has promised to call a special session this summer to try to again pass this complex omnibus law deemed SB7. 
SB 7 has included provisions that, among other devices, would restrict early voting hours, prohibit polling places from offering popular drive through voting, where voters can cast a ballot from their car, and reallocate polling places using a racially discriminatory formula. Even though SB 7's provisions are facially neutral, all the evidence shows that SB 7 would, in fact, disparately impact voters of color. So first, SB 7 would have mandated that voting take place no earlier than 6, 6 a.m. and no later than, 6, than 9 p.m. And this appears to be a direct response to extended hour initiatives implemented across Texas in recent years in a variety of counties, and particularly in Harris County, where eight 24-hour early voting locations were set up in 2020. These were aimed at voters who are shift workers and can't cast their votes during regular business hours. Our lawyer's analysis found that extended hour voting in Harris County in 2020 was disproportionately used by people of color, even though most of the people who voted early in Harris County were white. Moreover, SB 7 prohibited voting from taking place before 1 p.m. on Sundays, which was severely hamstring, if not eliminate, sold to the polls, which is a longstanding tradition in which black faith leaders encourage churchgoers to cast their ballots after services. Plus, in 2020, health concerns about COVID and Texas's refusal to expand voting by mail pushed innovation by local officials to make in-person in -person voting safer. I think the most popular, arguably, was drive-through voting in Harris County, which was used by approximately 127,000 voters, the majority of whom are voters of color. And despite the immense popularity of that, SB7 now seeks to permanently end this innovation. Finally, an earlier version of SB7, as originally passed by the Texas House, included a provision that would have required Texas counties with one million or more people, so these are all of our most racially diverse counties, to distribute polling places based on the share of registered voters in each state house district. I know that sounds complicated, but the effects were really clear. Polling places would be pulled away from communities of color. That's because these communities have lower registration rates, which is because of historical racism. In fact, a study by the Texas Tribune found that of the 13 state house districts in Harris County that would lose polling sites as a result, all but one are majority white. And this is the, exactly the type of device that the Voting Rights Act was originally implemented to protect against. One last thing. So for nearly five decades, there was something close to a bipartisan consensus in Congress that states with a long history of voting discrimination, like Texas, should be subject to robust federal oversight. And I'm going to go ahead and quote Ronald Reagan when he reauthorized the Voting Rights Act in 1982. He said the right to vote is the crown jewel of American liberties, and we will not see its luster diminish. Voting rights for people of color in Texas have been badly tarnished, and I urge all members of this committee to act now to restore them. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, at this time, the chair will recognize Commissioner Palmer for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Butterfield, Ranking Member Style, and members of the Subcommittee on Elections. I appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning regarding the 2020 elections and the work of the United States Election Assistance Commission. The EAC is a bipartisan agency focused on election administration and supporting election officials across the country. This vital mission includes offering guidance to improve polling place quality and accessibility for those who need additional assistance, ensuring that our voting systems can be used privately and independently, by voters with disabilities, and that the procedures are in place to ensure equal access to all Americans. Now, during the 2020 elections, the EAC responded immediately to the COVID-19 pandemic. We worked quickly in partnership with federal state partners to help local officials provide for the safety of their voters. These officials had to quickly adapt existing procedures to provide increased options for mail and absentee voting, move to consolidated or larger polling places, and include other options or innovations in voting. The increase in EAC operational funding and state grant funding made this essential assistance possible. Many states utilize their CARES Act grants to en enhance polling place access, and some states actually increasing the number of polling places and to provide other options to vote during the pandemic. For example, adding voting centers or consolidated polling places, additional days and hours of early voting, additional recruitment, training of poll workers, and acquisition of additional equipment all in an attempt to reduce potential congestion on election day and to keep the voters safe. On behalf of, behalf of my fellow commissioners and EAC personnel, we appreciate your support and the attention you pay to 
our mission. NEAC aspires to do more. As a non-regulatory agency, our clearinghouse function is an important part of our mission to improve the administration of elections. We've just recruited a team of subject matter experts to join the agency, including three leading election administrators. They have combined nearly 40 years of experience. We've also established a new position focused solely on the accessibility of voting systems, polling places, and every aspect of business at the AEC. This subject matter expert is devoted to election administration and ensuring election officials have the resources they need to serve the voters. We also are gonna have a current, we're gonna launch a new advisory board comprised of local election officials from the 50 states to provide recommendations to the EAC, get down to the local level. Together, EAC and state and local officials will continue to innovate, safeguard the integrity of our nation's elections and instill public confidence in those elections. Today's hearing addresses polling place quality and the potential barriers. While we have not received all election survey data, a recent U.S. Vote Foundation survey found that 89% of respondents indicated they were satisfied with the overall 2020 experience. This represents an improvement over 2016, a rate of 76%. Moreover, voters who cast their ballots in person at a polling place reported over 92% satisfaction, 92 satisfaction in 2020. Now, this is in line with other 2016 polling, where 95% of respondents said the performance of poll workers was excellent or very good. 2016 lines were shorter than they were in 2012, with 74% of voters waiting less than 10 minutes and 18% waiting between 10 and 30 minutes. That trend continues to move in the right direction. This was a similar positive opinion of polling place management, where 82% of respondents were saying things were run well at the polling place and 16% say things were run okay. State and local officials deserve high praise for these efforts. Election officials are truly public servants who prioritize customer service to voters. This is an impression of accomplishment, particularly with the COVID-19 burdens and last minute changes that the pandemic necessitated. As a former election official, I know that one size doesn't fit all for all voter needs. From polling place locations to the number of sites, Local officials are responsible for allocating resources based on the varying needs of their jurisdictions and the procedures governing them. While local governing bodies provide the resources and budgets for elections, the election officials are constantly reviewing their polling places to meet accessibility standards, identify new polling places that better meet community needs, determine where polling places are in strategic locations, locations to facilitate the vote of population centers in a fair manner, and deciding whether locations are large enough to efficiently process voters. So the, the election officials require the ability to act nimbly to meet the needs of a local population. The pandemic highlighted the importance of this flexibility. As election officials made quick decisions to identify locations with, that allow voters to better maintain social distancing, consolidate locations to account for a decrease in the number of poll workers. Other jurisdictions developed new procedures for a significant shift to larger scale of mail ballots to be printed, mailed, and returned. I'm gonna conclude briefly by talking about the Help America Vote Act. The, the Help America Vote Act and other laws affirm the voting rights and election procedures that are essential protecting our democracy. We take these mandates seriously to assist election officials, identify best practice, and serve voters. Our critical mission includes enhancing access to polling places. While the EAC's work supporting election officials help ensure a positive experience, we are already looking forward to 22. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And we thank you for your testimony as well. I think we will now move to member questions. Uh, the gentleman from California who will have a birthday next week, Mr. Aguilar, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that uh, reminder. Um, I wanted to start with uh, Mr. Wikipedia. Pettit. Wikipedia is pretty powerful. <laughs> <laughs> and occasionally correct. Uh, uh, Mr. Pettigrew, uh, in your in your written testimony, um, uh, you talked about you know, during the 2020 elections, voters experienced you know, long, long lines at polling sites uh, across the country. 
Um, and while the previous election was affected by the pandemic, uh, your written testimony and your and your verbal testimony here today uh, talked about uh, long lines have consistently remained a chronic problem for non-white voters. Um, and and just to to underscore and to make sure I heard you correctly, that uh, voters who are not white are three times as likely to wait longer than 30 minutes and six times as likely to wait more than 60 minutes to cast their ballot. Um, so I wanted to make sure I got that right. Um, but my first question to you is, how could a long line during one election discourage voters from participating in upcoming elections? And if you could share information from uh, specifically related to the data of your research uh, to demonstrate this. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question and happy early birthday to you. Um, uh, so yeah, so I, I, I recently, actually this month, it was finally in print, I published a paper um, on the question of how long lines affect future turnout. Um, I mean, it's, it's obvious that waiting hours and hours on election day or in early voting has a burden on the voters on that particular day. But one of the things that I find in my research is that, um, is that experiencing a long line um, in, in one election actually has a noticeable effect on whether or not a voter um, participates two or four years later. Um, and, 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 you know, that it, the way that I, I come about that, that conclusion is by, you know, I was looking at um, a, a giant beta database of, of voters and, and I had a good sense of, I had data on how long the lines were in their neighborhoods. Um, and I was able to essentially pair voters in a neighborhood with a short line against a voter in a neighborhood who, a, a voter who looked you know, demographically and, and um, you know, had a similar profile to a voter elsewhere in a, in a place where lines were longer. And what we see is that, um, is that the person um, who looks, you know, the, the two people who look similar, uh, the one who's in the neighborhood with the longer line was, was considerably less likely to turn out in subsequent elections. And so when you look at 2020, where we had, um, I think it was 16 million people wait, waiting longer than, than the 30 minutes that was suggested by the presidential commission about 10 years ago. Um, the, the implication is that that means hundreds of thousands of those people may, um, you know, they may not turn out in, in uh, 2022, for example. What opportunities could alleviate long wait times at polling sites uh, and ensure that voters have access to the ballot box? Yeah, I, I think of, you know, I kind of think of if I could wave a magic wand and, and try to solve this problem, I think the, there's three main things that I would want to do and want to see. Um, the first one is is more access to mail voting. Um, we saw, you know, turnout was very high in, in uh, 2020, um, largely because of mail balloting. And so having more access to that just means there's fewer people showing up to vote and, and fewer possibilities for long lines to develop. Um, another one, another, another thing I would change would be um, increasing opportunities to vote early or, or just having more hours of, um, of, of polls being open. Um, you know, ideally you'd have polls, you know, especially during the early voting period, seven, open seven days a week um, for the whole day, um, you know, maybe, maybe into the night to accommodate people who have, have difficult work schedules. And then the last thing I think is just more federal funding for local offices. I, don't, I, I think, um, you know, it was great to have an infusion of, of funding this year due to the pandemic, but, um, you know, I, I, a lot of these local offices haven't had a, a major influx of money in a long time. And so just giving them the resources to purchase more machines, uh, do a better job of recruiting more poll workers, all of that is going to have a tremendous impact on, on how long voters wait and, and how satisfied voters are with the process. Thanks so much. I uh, wanted to shift briefly to, to Commissioner Palmer. Um, thanks for your service with the EAC and, and to our country. Um, one of the troubling trends that we saw in the 2020 election was election officials, including EAC commissioners, were subject to uh, threats to their safety. Are you concerned that threats will discourage election officials, staff, and poll workers uh, from working future elections uh, and potentially impact voter access? Um, instinctively, I am concerned, but I do think that most uh, election officials, state and local, really have a dedication to their duties. And um, the dedication to the voters and to the process uh, outweighs their fear of, of you know, of threats to them on a personal level. Um, we have been talking about this as a community and uh, one of the ways that we intend to uh, address it is to 
do better training of what the options are dealing with local uh, law enforcement and federal resources when it comes to um, how, how to take care of ourselves and to our people and to our election offices and just reassure our poll workers and our election staff that uh, we care about them and that there are procedures in place like other communities that might receive threats. So uh, I, I am concerned, but um, again, I know that people really care about their, their job and uh, about the their commitment to the American voter and they'll continue to do their duties. Appreciate it. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, yield back. That's fine, thank you. At this time, the chair recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Morris, uh, you studied the spring 2020 primary election in Milwaukee, correct? Yes, that's correct. And in the city of Milwaukee, polling locations were reduced from 180 locations to five, correct? Yes, that is correct. And in the city of Milwaukee is a little more than one third African-American, correct? Uh, I, I don't have that number right in front of me, but that sounds about right. Yeah, a little, little over, I think it's closer to 38, but we'll call it a little over a third for, for sake of easy conversation. And in contrast, the city of Madison, located about 70 miles to the west, uh, 66 of 92 polling locations uh, remained open, also a democratic, de democratically uh, controlled city, uh, and less, but, also, uh, but less than 10% uh, African-American. In your analysis, Milwaukee turnout was reduced uh, by what percentage directly attributed uh, to the consolidation of polling locations? Uh, we estimate that it was about nine percentage points, uh, between eight but, and nine percentage points. And, and would that impact be uh, even more significant uh, for black residents in Milwaukee? Thank you for the question. Yeah, we uh, found that it was slightly, the negative turnout effect was slightly larger for black Milwaukee residents. I, I appreciate you, you looking into this. I hope the committee uh, takes the opportunity to, invest, to investigate this decision uh, by a democratically appointed election official in the city of Milwaukee uh, when one of the key elections in that spring uh, primary election uh, was a white incumbent Democratic uh, male mayor running against an African-American woman. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, I think it would surprise uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, that many of these closures were mandated uh, by Democrats and Democratic appointees. And so, Mr. Morris, I appreciate you uh, reviewing the Milwaukee uh, primary election, your, your review and insight into that. Uh, let me shift gears uh, over to you, Mr. Palmer, if I can. Uh, as part of the clearinghouse function, the EAC has engaged with state and local election officials to assist with election contingency planning. And as we saw last year, election officials across the country were tested at the highest levels as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and had to make emergency changes uh, to their processes and procedures for administering both the primary and general election to ensure that voters could vote safely and securely. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle are seeking to nationalize our country's election by implementing new unfunded federal mandates that would impact election officials' ability to administer federal elections. Are there mandates uh, that could limit an, an election official's ability in responding in an emergency. Could you comment on that? Well, the EAC, uh, the EAC isn't involved in that process. As a former lawyer at uh, the Department of Justice, uh, there, there used to be a process in place where which every change at the local level, uh, county, township, locality would be submitted. And there was a process for emergency procedures uh, but this was a unique year with a, a lot of major strategic changes and minor changes at the local level uh, just to make sure that the process was safe. And so, as you can see, there, there were a lot of procedures that were, um, that were made at the local level to get through the 2020 election. But if, but if those changes, say, say we're outside the, emer the Emergency Act, right, so there, there's an exclusion there you're identifying. If these were all being reviewed by the Department of Justice, what, what would have played out uh, if people were trying to make adjustments to make sure that people could vote safely and securely uh, during a very unique year? Well, there's a number, of, just based on my experience, there's a number of analysts uh, that are within the Department of Justice. Those requests would have to be submitted uh, for, and, and there would be a, a number of weeks or months uh, for the Department of Justice to review those. Each locality would have to submit those changes uh, to the department voting section uh, for preclearance. So it would have significantly al altered the ability of local election officials to carry out elections during the pandemic uh, for if those changes were trying to be made? 
It would have definitely slow down the process. I, I, I appreciate your feedback on that, Mr. Palmer. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I now yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member. At this time, the chair will recognize the general lady from New Mexico, my friend, Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Good morning, and thank you so much, uh, Chairman, for holding this hearing to examine how long lines, limited polls, and restricted voting alternatives negatively impact Americans' ability to vote. Uh, I agree with Ronald Reagan that elections are indeed the crown jewel of our democracy. So conversely, restricting our citizens' right to vote is simply un-American. Um, Dr. Pettigrew, you noted that long lines at polling places are due to systemic factors. And as recounted by Representative uh, Aguilar, that wait times are substantially longer for non-white voters than white voters. Um, do you agree with the recommendation that 30 minutes is a reasonable time to set as the goal for a wait time? Uh, at all polling places, and is that an amount of time you've seen in high, fight higher income precincts? Yeah, so so that recommendation came out of um, the 2013 Presidential Commission on Election Administration, which um, you know they did they did extensive study of of this specific question of how long seem, how long is reasonable, and and that's what they came to, and so that's that's what I've used in my research, and other political scientists have used, and it seems like a pretty uh, a pretty good standard. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the your other question about um, income and its its interplay with with line length, um, there is a relationship there. It's um, it's it's definitely not as stark as the as the sort of the relationship between race and uh, and voting, but um, but it does seem that um, that voters. Uh, let me make sure I get this right. That voters who live in higher income areas tend to have shorter lines um, than voters in um, in uh, lower income areas, um, but again, that you know that that relationship isn't nearly as strong as um, as the race relationship. And in, and in fact, in some of my research, um, I, I in evaluating the relationship with race, I was taking into account things like income, and and the the effect of race was still quite quite large. Thank you. Um, do you think that disparate rate times, uh, where we have this. Uh, disparate wait times uh, primarily on the factor of race, as you notice, should be a factor, could be a factor to trigger preclearance under a revised, a revised Voting Rights Act? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I, it's honestly, I haven't, I haven't given a ton of thought to it, but it does seem like a reasonable, um, uh, it does seem like a reasonable thing to, to have as a, as a piece of the puzzle, um, especially given that, um, you know, as I talk about in my written testimony, um, what we find is um, that that long lines tend to be uh, a chronic problem in certain areas. It's not as if um, you know we have long lines popping up randomly across the country. And and as an example, I talk about in my written testimony about how um, you know South Carolina is a state that over the last I think since about 2008 they've consistently been one of the four or five states with the sh with the longest lines and and Vermont is a state on the other end of the spectrum where they're one of the few states that have the shortest lines and so um so so the fact that lines are a chronic problem suggests that there's some sort of systematic problem going on there and um and yeah perhaps um you know using that as a as a measure of where you know where preclearance needs to happen um it, it seems reasonable to me yeah Thank you. Um, Mr. Morris, you testified that voters of color had to fight harder to vote than white voters. How does this statement address the claims made at the beginning of this hearing that the higher turnout in 2020 demonstrates we don't have a voting access problem that needs fixing? And what is your response to uh, these claims? Thank you for that question. Um, I think it's, it's important to recognize that it is a wonderful thing that we saw as high a turnout in the last few elections as we did. Um, but we still didn't have 100% turnout. Uh, there are still eligible citizens who, who uh, did not participate. And I would imagine that some of those are individuals who um, the costs were too high to participate or the information was not clear enough or they had to travel too far to get to their polling place. Um, and so I guess my, my feeling is that high turnout doesn't necessarily mean that there are no problems anymore. Um, and, and we know there's a growing literature in the political science world um, showing that some of these, these regressive voting laws do disproportionately impact voters of color. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, factors that increase turnout for everybody, but might increase turnout more for white voters can still lead to, to discrepancies in the electorate. Thank you. Uh, I did want to ask uh, Ms. McCur uh, uh, Ms. McCurdy uh, regarding the three and a half years to ban North Carolina's law for the, uh, uh, that she had in her written testimony that claimed it was the most restricted voting law North Carolina has seen since the era of Jim Crow and what that told us about the need to reinstate Section 5, but I see my time has expired, so perhaps that could be a written question that she responds to uh, uh, in writing. And I yield back, Mr. Chair. I thank the gentlelady. Thank you very much. At this time, the chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, my friend, Mr. Davids. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you to my colleagues. Uh, I, I will save the committee and anyone watching my happy birthday song to Mr. Aguilar. I'll just sing it to you in person next week, Pete, if that's all right. Hey, uh, Mr. Morris, I'm glad I followed you. Uh, I'm glad to, to, to understand that, that you feel as though uh, that people may not have been able to go vote, but you don't have the statistics to back a lot of that up. I certainly hope we can get some of the experts at this hearing to, to do an analysis of why we didn't get to 100% voter turnout. Um, is that something, Mr. Morris, that, that you're suggesting that, that we should have compulsory voting in the United States? I, I'm not suggesting that. Um, I, I more was making the point that there's still room for us to do better. Um, I appreciate the question, but um, there is a lot of room. There is a lot of room for us to do better. And, and frankly, Mr. Morris, I, I don't think we get enough credit as the United States for what we did right the last two election cycles. How about you? Um, I think that uh, we, it's a wonderful thing that we saw turn out as high as we did for the last two two federal elections. Absolutely, and especially in the midst of a pandemic, when we had local election officials um, trying to use the limited resources they had to give everybody access, and, and that's that's what's amazing. I mean, I, I, we know what the end game of the subcommittee hearing process is going to be. We're gonna call for uh, covered jurisdictions for every single jurisdiction in America. Um, I, I certainly would be interested in whether or not this subcommittee will put out a report that would, would advocate for compulsory voting as we see in other countries. But I appreciate your optimism on what happened in 18 and 20, and appreciate your uh, expression of of your opinion and, and feelings as to what we can do to make it better and certainly hope we can get some statistical analysis in the future to see what we can do to drive those last vestiges of, of folks out and, and what really stopped them from going to vote is, you know, I, mean, I feel too that many of them may just not have wanted to go vote. Maybe they didn't like the two candidates running. Who knows? That's what's great about America. It's their choice. Hey, uh, Mr. Palmer, glad to have you back, sir, uh, as the chair of the EAC and also uh, as a former elections administrator, what are some of the practical considerations the election officials must consider right now in polling place management? Well, polling place, polling place management, I mean, when you talk about trying to reduce lines, I worked at the Bipartisan Policy Center on this, and I've really come to the conclusion that it's, it's about an investment in technology, it's about more accurate voter rolls to make sure that we are allocating the voting equipment properly, that election officials at the local level have that information, and the local governing bodies have that information about where voters are, how many registered voters per precinct, that sort of solution. I also think that um, I'm always a believer in more training and transparency, and I think that if we have the resources and the time, I think localities need to invest in better training of their poll workers, uh, and be, being able to understand that other voters have may have needs in language assistance or with disabilities. Uh, and so they're prepared for any event that takes place. But like I said in my testimony, some of the statistics are really good when it comes to the opinion of voters for elect, local election officials that they're actually serving them. And that's very encouraging from my perspective. Oh, do you think, uh, Mr. Palmer, that when you look at when you look at the state's a state's failure to conduct list maintenance as required under the National Voter, Voter Registration Act, do you think that could have an impact on long lines at polling places? Well, it absolutely, yeah, it absolutely does. The Presidential Commission on Election Administration um, a number of years ago, you know, it identified that when there, there's uh, individuals that are no longer living in the jurisdiction uh, it really does provide a misallocation of resources. And so you may have two 
two, uh, two polling places in an area where a lot of the people may have left already, or you have an increase in voters in one other area of the county, if your registration rules aren't accurate, it's very possible that you, you may not be as prepared as you think you are to efficiently handle voters that come to the polling place. And so there's always gonna be lines. A lot of these uh, high turnout elections, uh, election officials wanna make sure they have the most accurate data to efficiently process them and make sure that there's enough equipment to, to process them through the voting process so the next voter in line can vote in a timely manner. Right, right. I know I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. One last question. Has the EAC conducted any studies on polling location wait times? And will election administrators ever be able to get rid of wait times for voting? Um, I don't know if I have a precise answer to that question. I know we did some work with the uh, Bipartisan Policy Center on that. And I did a lot of work personally on identifying that. And so there has been a lot of people, including members of the panel, that have looked at this issue. And my general comment would be that it, it's really improved over the years. Over every election, there's been an improvement in that process going back all the way back to 2012. Um, once we start targeting the issue using data, election officials have been sort of oriented to the problem, how to resolve the problem, and there's been a response to it. So. It, to me, it's one of those examples where there was a problem. We really put some of the best minds together to identify what sort of resources would help local election officials uh, solve the issue. And we generally are improving in that area. Great. I, I have no more time. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Davis. At this time, the chair will recognize the general lady from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, my friend, Mary Gay Scanlon. Take it away, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for convening this next in our series of hearings on voting rights. Um, I'd like to direct my questions to Dr. Pettigrew from also from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and um, my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, Pennsylvania in the last election cycle had the interesting experience of having for the first time um, universal mail-in uh, ballots available. Our Republican legislature had passed, also with support from Democrats, a law in October 2019, pre-pandemic, um, had passed a law that for the first time allowed no excuses mail-in voting. And millions of Pennsylvanians took advantage of that during the pandemic. Now, obviously, that created some issues because we hadn't had that access before and many of our counties were not quite prepared for that, but they performed as, as Mr. Davis suggested, they performed admirably and with great integrity um, in meeting the challenges of the day. Um, can you speak about how having access to early and no excuses mail-in voting can help address issues of lines at polling places? Yeah, certainly. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, as you noted, we had, uh, you know, Pennsylvania was one of many states that that provided voters with more opportunities to vote by mail. What's interesting about 2020 is that, um, you know, we had a turnout that was higher than we've ever had before, but the number of uh, of people who voted in person nationwide was actually a lot smaller than it had been in any election since I think at least 2008. That was as far back as I looked. We had about I think about 15 or 20 million people, uh, fewer, 15 or 20 fewer uh, people voting in person in 2020 than in 2016. And a lot of that is attributable to mail voting. And, and what a lot of the research shows on this point is that, um, is that you know, increasing access to mail voting will have a, have a positive impact on lines because it just means there's fewer people showing up on election day or during the early period. And, and similarly, having more opportunities to vote in person during an, the early voting period, it also has a, a good impact on lines. Now, obviously 2020, what we saw, so, so um, as was noted by, by um, others, you know, we've had, there's been progress made on this issue of lines. Now, 2020 was, um, was a year where the lines actually were longer. A lot of the data we have suggests that lines were longer than they had been in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And I think a lot of that is probably attributable to things related to the pandemic in particular. Um, but, uh, but yeah, early voting or, or more early voting, more mail voting, those are, um, those are great ways to uh, limit capacity, limit the number of people showing up and limit the possibility for bottlenecks to create long lines and bad experiences for voters. Thank you. Yes. And I know just, you know, 
having for years, you know, been working a full-time job and having kids to get to soccer games and, and everything on every end of the day, it can be a struggle for folks to get to the polling place during the hours that are available. So um, just from a practical standpoint, it's, it's wonderful to have the option to vote when convenient. Um, and I know you mentioned research on this um, from speaking with um, folks who run elections in states that have had mail-in voting for some time, Colorado, Washington. They talk about the fact that it increases um, participation. Isn't that right? Yeah, there's some research on that that suggests that um, that it, it, it can have uh, a, a, a positive impact on turnout. Right. And I, I would second what you said about, you know, some of the lines we saw in 2020. We did see that issue as well, having lines at polling places. But in part, it was because so many of our polling places, at least in Pennsylvania, um, are often staffed by seniors. And of course, the pandemic had a disproportionately harsh effect on seniors. And many of them chose not to volunteer this year because of concerns for their health. So that created staffing shortages, which we also had to deal with. But um, overall, it, it appears that we have the know-how, we have the means to move forward to make it easier for people to vote safely and vote in our systems that have you know, integrity. So um, thank you for the work that's gone into the research on this panel to show that we can do this. Um, and with that, I would yield back. Thank you, Ms. Scandler. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, at this time, the chair will recognize himself for five minutes. Let me begin with you, Ms. McCurdy. Thank you again for your testimony. Thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, Ms. McCurdy, you noted in your testimony that since the Shelby County case back on June 25th, 2013, a day that we shall never forget, uh, polling places have been significantly reduced in formerly covered jurisdictions. What has been the impact of these closures on the voting experience of African-American voters, Hispanic voters, Asian-American voters, and any other racial minorities? What, what has been the impact? I mean, I think you've heard some of the evidence of the impact in some of the testimony today. Long lines, confusion about polling places, um, being, uh, you know, standing in, in or, or being in a situation where you're not able to vote because you don't know the uh, information about early voting or voting hours, um, consolidation of polls, uh, you go to the wrong poll, you find out that you're at, uh, that you get the consolidated poll is too far away for you to make it before the, the, voting, the, the voting polls close. And so in that um, disenfranchises many people and to the question that has been asked about long lines and how that discourages people in the next election, election, when you stand in a long line in 2020 to vote, and then you have to plan your voting process for 2022, you take that in account and you tell, ask yourself whether or not you have you will have time to stand in the long line that you assume that you'll have to um, in 2022 when you're planning your your vote your uh, self to vote and oftentimes that discourages people from voting when they think that's in on their experience thank you thank you election. for that you know over the next few weeks we are going to be doing some legislating in this space we've already uh, passed hr1 the for the people act in the house of representatives and we are waiting for action in the senate on that but over the next few weeks we hope to be introducing hr4 what well, what reforms should congress undertake to combat disenfranchising effects on polling places. That's something that you're concerned about, we're concerned about. What can we do to combat disenfranchising effects on polling places? Well, I think, I think, I, I think I lost my video. Uh, were you able to hear the question? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes. So, I mean, I think the most important thing is to, um, is to pass uh, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act and that will create a new um, new formulas for areas who are have historically of uh, there were historically uh, discrimination um, in particular for black brown and indigenous people and um, and the, so the Department of Justice can take a look at any of these voting changes before they become in, before they are effective and make sure they do not have a racial impact 
That is the most important thing. What we are seeing since the Shelby County decision is there's no analysis around the racial impact that these voting um, changes will have. And they're also not transparent and there's not notice that is given to, given to voters when there are changes. And that's where you see the confusion come in. And, and let me thank you for mentioning our intent to, to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And we certainly plan to do that. Uh, but the purpose of these hearings, and we're going to have 16 hearings. This committee is having, uh, this subcommittee is having six hearings. I think the House Judiciary Committee is having uh, six or seven, and, and the Senate Judiciary Committee will be doing the same. But we're going to have these 16 hearings because we want to build a, a, a very uh, significant legislative record that will be persuasive to the Supreme Court if this were ever challenged. Let me conclude by talking to uh, Ms. Marciana. In your testimony, you make note of the fact that your state previously had to seek preclearance before changing any voting law or policy and that the state is no longer uh, must demonstrate that the proposed change would not negatively impact the participation of people of color. How has the lack of any required impact analysis negatively impacted your voters? <laughs> I mean, in myriad ways. And, and again, I've submitted extensive evidence in my written remarks of the voting law changes, which sadly have been numerous. Um, just on polling place closures alone, we've heard that Texas closed more than um, any other state in recent years. The Texas Civil Rights Project did an analysis of county compliance with state election law and actually found that in 2018, Texas was short as many as 270 polling places across the whole state that impacted more than 4 million people. And the um, lacks were the, the um, reduction of polling places was particularly impactful in um, cities like Waco, Texas, that have large black populations. So, you know, we, we see it honestly in almost everywhere you look at voting in Texas. And as I said, unfortunately, lawmakers seem poised to pass yet another law this summer without any sort of impact on the racial disparities that it, it threatens Thank to you. have. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Let me thank all of the witnesses for your testimony. It's been very insightful and, and we thank you very much. You're helping us to build a legislative record that will be very, very valuable as we write the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act. Thank you very, very much. In just a moment, we're going to be moving to our second panel. Uh, I'm going to take a two-minute break, if you will, a two-minute break.
All right, the subcommittee is now back in, in session. Uh, thank you for your patience, and thank you again to our first panel. Joining us today on our second panel are Michael Heron of Dartmouth University, Gilda Daniels of Advancement Project, Danielle Lang of Campaign Legal Center, Isabel Lagari, I cannot pronounce it, help me, staff, Langaria, thank you, uh, the Elections Administrator of Harris County, Texas, and Ashley Titus of the Lawyers Democracy Fund. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Next, we have Dr. Michael Heron. Uh, Dr. Heron is the William Clinton Story Remsen 1943 Professor of Government at, at the legendary Dart, Dartmouth University. His areas of expertise include election administration and applied statistical methods, and his research has analyzed the impact of a variety of, variety of election administration practices on turnout and minority voters. Dr. Heron holds his degree, his PhD degree in political science from Stanford University. Next is Gilda Daniels. Ms. Daniels is the Director of Litigation at the Advancement Project and an Associate Professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law. She is a nationally recognized voting rights and election law expert, served as a deputy chief in the voting section of the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division under President Clinton and President Bush. Next is Danielle Lang. Danielle is the director of the voting rights program at the Campaign Legal Center, where she litigates a wide range of voting rights and redistricting matters before federal courts, including our Supreme Court. Ms. Lang also has an active amicus brief before the Supreme Court and other federal courts, as she is an adjunct, adjunct professor at Georgetown Law, where she teaches an election law practicum. Uh, Isabel, help me again, staff. Longoria, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank God for staff. Uh, Ms. Longoria is the elections administrator for Harris County, Texas. She is the first person to serve in the newly created office appointed by the County Commissioner's Court. During the 2020 election, she worked alongside Harris County Clerk Chris Hollins at the County Elections Office, helping implement many of the successful and innovative voting policies in Harris County that they used during the election of 2020. Finally, Ashley Titus. Ashley is a board member and the corporate secretary of the Lawyers Democracy Fund. She is a partner uh, at the law firm of Bell, McAndrews, and Hilfbeck, uh, which she joined in 2004. And she maintains a nationwide law practice, advising clients on compliance with complex campaign finance and advertising, lobbying, and nonprofit tax exempt statutes and regulations. Thank you to the witnesses. And now I will recognize each witness. I will begin with Dr. Heron. Uh, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Representative Butterfield and Representative Style for this opportunity to speak to the committee. I appreciate this. Um, my work as an academic is in the field of what's called election administration. We obviously heard a lot about that in the first panel. Um, this is a field in political science. It dates roughly to 2000. That's uh, in the presidential election that was uh, complicated, disputed then. That was the origin of a lot of interest in political science in the sort of questions that we're engaging in discussion today. Uh, my own research uh, reflects that as well. Um, it is a nonpartisan field. People interested in election administration study how it is that voters uh, cast their ballots, not uh, why some are Democrats or Republicans. I just want to emphasize that so it's clear that this is really a scientific field, um, trying to understand how a system works. A key concept uh, in the field of election administration is what's called the cost of voting. Uh, this refers to uh, a cost, not, not necessarily a financial cost, that individuals must pay in order to participate in democracy. So uh, one cost is time, it's called the time tax, uh, people waiting in line is a cost of voting, uh, gathering documents, traveling to vote, uh, possibly determining where to vote. These are all activities that um, incur costs, and so it's a generic uh, part of a cost of voting for a voter. One question that people in election administration uh, address is, um, is the cost of voting roughly the same for all Americans? This is a question about equal treatment. 
Um, it's different than the question is, is the cost of voting low? It's the question, are all voters treated the same in this matter? So I'll return to that briefly at the end of my presentation. Um, the cost of voting, uh, I'll organize my thoughts around this. Um, there, are there have been efforts across, within the past several decades in the United States to lower the cost of voting uh, for Americans. Um, these are travel under the name of convenience measures or convenience voting. Uh, two of them that are very common or prominent now are early voting um, and voting by mail. Early voting is voting in person um, uh, prior to election day. And the research on this study has two consistent findings. Uh, one is that minority voters are disproportionately heavy users of early voting. My own work shows this. Um, we already heard about souls to the polls. My own work sort of shows uh, the effect of Sunday early voting for minority voters, in particular African Americans. So we see that regularly uh, across the country. Um, the second finding in the literature on early voting is that more of it leads to more voting. The effects are not enormous, but they are there nonetheless. And when I say more of it, I'm referring to days and times. Uh, states have discretion over where, how much early voting they want to offer. Many states don't offer any, but the ones that do can have can choose number of days and hours. So the research that's primarily come out of the state of Ohio shows that more early voting leads to voting, uh, leads to more voting in general. Um, uh, the second uh, convenience measure that I mentioned earlier is voting by mail. Um, so we've heard again about this in the first panel. Uh, we know that there was a surge in voting in vote by mail in the pandemic election. And just to draw out um, the consequences for the cost of voting, I just wanted to like, give you some statistics from Florida uh, that are broken down by race. So if we compare, say, the vote by mail rates in Florida in 2016 and in 2020, what we notice is that the, that the African American voters surged heavily toward vote by mail, 89% um, increase from say 20% of African, African American voters uh, in Florida voting by mail in 2016 to 393 of them in 2020. Um, that's a much greater increase than any other uh, ethnic or racial group in Florida. And this just illustrates how certain types of groups uh, take advantage of, of uh, convenience voting and at different rates. Um, there are two other aspects of the cost of voting that I just want to briefly touch on. We've heard about them before. One is that one is lines, uh, and, and Professor Pettigrew already summarized the literature on that, which shows that uh, minority voters um, have to spend extra time in line compared to non-minority voters. In other words, their cost of voting is greater. Um, and in addition, there is literature on the effect of, of uh, voters receiving new polling places. So um, this literature, which is uh, concentrated in Florida, North Carolina, and California, shows that um, when individuals receive new polling places, that their voting rates uh, tend to drop in a very slow, in a subtle way, but they tend to be lower in future elections, much as uh, voters who wait in lines tend to have slightly lower turnout rates in future elections. We know that um, these features of election administration, lines, polling places, schools, and so forth, uh, disproportionately affect minority voters. Um, and that means that these individuals, circling back to sort of how I wanted to start, disproportionately have higher costs of voting than non-minority voters. Um, and that, just, um, that shows that these election administration practices have consequences for equal treatment of voters, and in particular, different racial and ethnic groups in the country. Thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony. This time, the chair recognizes Mrs. Daniels for five minutes. Thank you to Chairperson Butterfield and to the Committee on House Administration Subcommittee on Election for holding today's important hearing discussing how voting restrictions impede the right to vote. I have more than two decades of expertise in the voting rights area. I have dedicated my career to ensuring free and fair access to the right to vote. It is appropriate to have this discussion today with the onslaught of proposed legislation across the country that has as its intent to make it harder to access the right to vote. My testimony today will discuss historical and contemporaneous challenges to the right to vote, the disproportionate impact on voters of color and the need for federal legislation that protects the right to vote. So we have been here before. We've seen these cycles of voter suppression and they are throughout our history from the founding where only white male property owners were allowed to vote, certainly to the passage of the Civil War amendments where during reconstruction, black men were able to elect persons to local, state and federal offices. Historians said that it was the first time that we witnessed a multiracial democracy. In my book, 
encountered the crisis of voter suppression in America, I have a subtitle that says free at last, not so fast, which is certainly what uh, they experienced because shortly, th shortly thereafter, we saw literacy tests, grandfather clauses, poll taxes, felon disenfranchisement, and all white primaries as prevalent conniving methods that prevented people of color from registering and, and accessing the right to vote. It was state laws throughout the South and other parts of the country that barred people of color from the voting, from the voting booth. It was the Voting Rights Act that provided black and brown people the ability to access the right to vote. The impact of the Voting Rights Act cannot be overstated. We must note that blacks have been in this country for 400 years and have only been voting for 56. This is a testament to the power of the Voting Rights Act. It removed barriers such as the literacy test, as well as poll taxes and other disenfranchising mechanisms and allowed black and brown people across the country, but particularly in the South and Southwest to access the right to vote. The act has been severely weakened and endures constant assault. The Shelby County versus Holder decision, which has been discussed earlier, sounded the alarm for legislatures to once again pass laws that would make access to the right to vote harder and impede the ability of voters of color. Some states responded almost immediately to pass restrictive and suppressive legislation that adversely impacted voters of color. Since Shelby, a weakened Voting Rights Act allows states to engage in the process of voter suppression without consequence. And that is certainly what we are seeing today. Advancement Project has chronicled the Shelby effect on communities of color in several publications that are included in my written testimony. And I would ask that they would be included in, and entered into the record today. Uh, we conducted people's hearings across the country in 2019 and allowed uh, persons to provide firsthand accounts and tell the story of resilience, perseverance, and voter suppression. Voters of color encounter a plethora of problems in their attempt to exercise their right to vote. When polling places close or other barriers are erected to access the right to vote, the burden and cost of voting increases tremendously in communities of color. Since the Shelby decision, voters of color have been increasingly harmed by polling site closures, language access barriers, state's failure to comply with the ADA, financial barriers to voting, and lack of transparency on voting law changes, among many other voter suppression tactics. These tactics force voters to travel long distances to register or to cast a ballot, and certainly are inclusive of those cost of voting measures that Professor Heron just recently discussed. We saw in, in November 2020, Certainly, the, 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 the access, that access to early weekend voting was crucial, and we saw that certainly in Georgia that, that voters of color participated in, 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 in the voters of color participated in uh, souls to the polls and weekend voting at a higher percentage than white voters. We've also, Advancement Project and other civil rights organizations have been engaged in certainly trying to expand access to the ballot in 2020 and are now uh, challenging laws that seek to roll back that access in 2021. Um, it, as a former deputy chief in the Civil Rights Division voting section, I must say that litigation is not enough. Litigation alone will not address the widespread assault on the right to vote. Without Section 5, we have returned to the piecemeal litigation that does not address the systemic problem. Congress must pass legislation that addresses the disproportionate impact and burden on voters of color accessing the right to vote, which requires states with a proven history of voter suppression and discrimination to prove that any changes to their election laws will not disenfranchise voters. Congress has the power to rewrite, and certainly to write an ending that supports access and addresses the disproportionate impact on voters of colors, on, on voters of color. Um, this should not be a partisan issue. It is an issue that is fundamental to our democracy. And I encourage Congress to protect our democracy and pass appropriate legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Daniels. At this time, the chair will recognize Ms. Lang for five minutes. Good afternoon, and thank you to the committee for holding these hearings and the opportunity to testify on these important matters. Voting in America today does not occur solely in person on a single Tuesday. 
Americans routinely vote early, in person, or by mail. Indeed, for many Americans, including those with disabilities, student voters, elderly voters, voters of color, and low-income voters with unforgiving schedules and limited transportation, these voting options are a necessary lifeline. But early in-person voting and vote by mail options are wildly uneven nationwide. While some Americans enjoy a broad range of voting opportunities, others face increasing constraints on their voting options. Early in-person voting access, which ensures that the fundamental right to vote does not hinge on one schedule on a single day, is an essential component of our voting system. Weekend voting days are particularly crucial for those who cannot afford to lose pay or risk job security to vote during working hours. And unsurprisingly, voters of color take advantage of early voting options at higher rates. After all, as you've already heard, they are more likely to face structural barriers to voting on election day and longer wait times at the polls. Further, Black voters have rallied around Sunday voting options to organize highly effective souls to the polls campaigns. Early in-person voting is just as secure as election day voting, yet legislators have sought to restrict it when people of color use it effectively. In 2011, Florida eliminated a Sunday voting day after 2008 election data showed that Black and Hispanic voters used Sunday voting the most and white voters used Sunday voting the least. In 2013, North Carolina also eliminated a Sunday voting day because of its disproportionate use by Black voters, leading a court to call it as close to a smoking gun as we are likely to see in modern times. And in 2014, Ohio eliminated its Golden Week, an overlapping period of early voting and voter registration, an option that was, once again, most popular with Black voters. Finally, just this session, both Georgia and Texas legislators pushed albeit unsuccessfully for now, bills that would eliminate or severely restrict Sunday voting. In addition to early voting, we know that equitable vote by mail practices increase voter participation. These practices include universal eligibility, reasonable application and submission procedures, and opportunities to correct technical errors. But once again, Americans fare much, some Americans fare much better than others on this score. First, while most states now give all voters the option to vote by mail, 16 states continue to limit access to voters that fit within rigid criteria, locking most residents out. Second, the processes for vote by mail can make the option elusive. In Mississippi, a vote by mail application has to be notarized. In Alabama, the ballot must be accompanied by a copy of a photo ID and a notary or two witness signatures. In Minnesota, a mail ballot requires a signature from another registered Minnesota voter, an obvious hurdle for out-of-state voters. In fact, we've seen students take to Twitter to try to find Minnesotans in their area to witness their ballots. Third, states have restricted access to secure ballot drop boxes. Last year, about 41% of mail-in voters chose to use drop boxes. Yet Texas and Ohio both moved to limit drop boxes to one per county. Predictably, this hit large urban counties with the highest percentage of voter colors, uh, voters of color the hardest. And fourth, in some states, election officials have unfettered discretion to reject a ballot if they perceive discrepancies in the voter's signature, leading to the disproportionate rejection of ballots of voters of color. And while most states now allow voters to fix such issues, a few states, notably Texas and Tennessee, do not. Indeed, Tennessee's mail voting rules are a model in what not to do. The state has rigid eligibility criteria, refuses access to most first-time voters, criminalizes distribution of applications, does not allow any drop boxes, and has no process to allow voters to fix discrepancies. And this year, Georgia and Kansas have mimicked Tennessee by prohibiting or restricting the mere distribution of mail ballot applications to voters. Finally, our electoral system wholly ignores the approximately 750,000 voters who find themselves in jails on election day. These voters are largely eligible to vote, but de facto disenfranchised because jails and election officials alike have not set up systems to enable their participation. This Congress has a historic opportunity to create an equitable baseline of voting opportunities and stop the onslaught of discriminatory voting proposals Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And thank you for your testimony.
At this time, the chair recognizes Ms. Longoria uh, for five minutes. You're recognized. Thank you, Chair. My name is Isabel Longoria, and I'm the Elections Administrator of Harris County, home to Houston, Texas, and the third largest county in the United States, and one of the most diverse. During the November 2020 presidential election, despite a global pandemic, Harris County had a historic 1.68 million voters participate in a safe, accessible, transparent, and equitable manner. The increased turnout was driven by innovations like drive-through voting, 24-hour voting, and a proactive mail ballot program. Methods that intentionally and successfully increased voting in minority communities and reduced wait times. For example, though only 38% of early voters in the presidential election were Black, Latino, or Asian, 53% of those communities used drive-through voting. The increased turnout has been sustained in multiple elections since, nearly doubling in our most recent local May elections. However, instead of promoting and expanding these voting initiatives, in Texas, we have been met with lawsuits and extremist legislation to restrict these efforts, such as Texas Senate Bill 7, stopped only by a quorum break just a few weeks ago, that would have hurt voters of color in voting in Harris County and beyond. And here's how. First, forbidding election offices from sending mail ballot applications directly to voters. In Texas, where we have neither online voter registration nor online mail ballot applications, preventing our offers from sending applications means that voters must bear the cost of printing and mailing their own applications annually, which they must uh, also do, and it provides a system that disproportionately affects those without printers and computers, such as low-income minority communities. Second, expanding voter ID requirements to mail ballot ap applications, creating an unnecessary hurdle for the disabled and senior voters most likely to use mail ballots, and for which we already have a proven signature verification pro process to validate. Third, limiting voting hours by applying Jim Crow S sundown laws to voting, thereby banning 24-hour voting, which is often used in communities of color, and specifically preventing voting before 1 p.m. on Sundays, a direct attack on souls to the polls programs used at black churches. Fourth, preventing options like drive-through voting, which have become a standard practice in Harris County over the past four elections that reduce wait times, increase access for voting, and again, are used more often by voters of colors than their peers. Fifth, moving election day voting locations from black, Latino, and Asian neighborhoods to primarily white neighborhoods in reaction to the fact that we increase, sometimes even doubling, the number of voting locations in our elections. Sixth, giving poll watchers carte blanche at voting locations, a force that has been used historically and today to purposefully intimidate voters of color. Seventh, restricting access to voters with disabilities by limiting the disabilities that qualify for mail ballot voting and then forcing those voters to prove their disability, even going so far as to require extreme provision on family members and assistance during curbside voting and option exclusively for people with disabilities. While we await the governor of Texas to call a special legislative session to pass these blatant low-income minority and disabled community voter suppression laws, I remind this committee that none of these restrictions would be possible under a voting rights preclearance state, which is why I, as an elections administrator, believe the need for federal intervention in the conduct of elections is clear and urgent. Because without federal intervention, Texas leaders will continue rewriting the state election code to disproportionately harm voters of color. And while everyone else gets to talk about it, I'm the one who has to make it happen. So for those with the pithy argument that preclearance is just too much work for election offices like mine, give me a break. My duty as a civil servant is to jump through hoops so that voters don't have to. No voter protection will ever be too onerous for me to implement when compared to the alternative of a weakened democracy. So in summation, Harris County, Texas supports federal legislation that would provide nationally guaranteed fair elections free from voter suppression, restoring the full protections of the Voting Rights Act, including a preclearance process, and other initiatives like online voter registration and universal mail ballots that help voters vote. And with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. At this time, the chair recognizes Ms. Titus for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Butterfield, Ranking Member Style, and members of the committee for allowing me to speak today on the important issue of free and fair access to the ballot. It is essential to a functioning and enduring democracy and ensures all eligible voters can vote and be confident that their votes count. It means that citizens recognize the election as free and fair and therefore accept the results of an election no matter which candidate wins. 
safeguards that protect the freedom and fairness of the entire election process give the American people, people that confidence in the election results. My name is Ashley Titus. I'm an attorney at Bell, McAndrews, and Hilltack in Sacramento, California, specializing in campaign finance and election law. As part of my practice, I organize lawyers to observe elections in California and have been an observer myself in several California counties over the last 17 years. I also serve as the secretary and on the board of directors of Lawyers Democracy Fund, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to promoting the role of ethics and legal professionalism in the electoral process. LDS research focuses on the effectiveness of current election methods and in particular on voter confidence. As this committee explores the intersection of ballot access and election security, it is vital to keep in mind the current crisis in voter confidence. Recent polls indicate that an astonishing 41% of voters say the November election was not well run and 39% of people did not have confidence in the 2020 election results. It is not a lack of ballot access that prevents voters from participating. It is a lack of voter confidence in the voting system. The Knight Foundation found in early 2020 that 38% of non-voters do not believe election results accurately reflect the will of the people. Voter confidence is the real issue at hand. And the only way to increase confidence is to implement and maintain effective ballot integrity safeguards. Efforts to expand voting opportunities and maintain effective ballot integrity uh, opportunities have unfortunately not been effective in increasing voter participation. For example, studies consistently show that early voting does not increase turnout and actually risks reducing turnout. This is because it shifts existing voters from election day to early voting without recruiting new voters, raises the cost and complication of get out the vote efforts, and decreases focus on election day as a civic event. My home state of California has perhaps the most open ballot access laws in the country. Yet, in spite of California's ballot access laws, which are designed to optimize opportunities to vote, often at the expense of the integrity of elections, California's voter turnout in 2020 was average compared to other states across the country. Not only do laws aimed at increasing opportunities to vote often fail to increase voter turnout, when they are enacted without proper safeguards, they risk undermining the ele entire electoral system they are trying to improve. Consider laws allowing for third party ballot collection, also known as ballot harvesting or ballot trafficking. This is where someone other than the voter, often a paid political operative, collects and returns any number of voters mail ballots. Unscrupulous harvesters can pressure voters to cast their ballot in a particular way and in doing so undermine the secrecy of the ballot box a long-held essential principle of American elections intended to preserve the right to vote one's conscience. The sad reality is that those at most risk from coercion or disenfranchisement by an unscrupulous ballot harvester are the most vulnerable in our society. But even if states put meaningful limitations on ballot harvesting to ensure integrity, allowing 24-hour unmonitored drop boxes to receive voted ballots makes these limitations nothing more than words on paper. Unmonitored drop boxes create de facto unlimited ballot harvesting and present a genuine risk to the security of every voter's ballot deposited in such a box. Drop boxes need extensive physical security protections to prevent voted ballots from being destroyed or lost and systematic procedures implemented by elections officials to timely and securely retrieve ballots and deliver them to their office for processing. The solution to increasing voter participation is not to force California's constantly changing rules on the entire country. It is to build voter confidence through the enactment of effective election security safeguards and clear procedures established well in advance of an election to allow voters time to understand and election administrators time to implement. Each state should be free to enact the appropriate election methods that serve the diverse needs of its electorate, coupling procedures that make voting more accessible with safeguards that protect the integrity of the process. No state needs to look the same. One state could restrict ballot harvesting while providing mobile voting units to rural voters, and another could expand um, ballot harvesting or uh, voting while providing strong chain of custody laws and monitor drop boxes. Thank you for the opportunity to present my comments and my perspective to the committee. And we thank you for your testimony as well. It is now time for member questions, and as usual, we will start with the gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar. Five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Longoria, 
from the Harris County perspective, you talked about uh, drive-through voting in the 2020 election. Uh, and through this new and innovative method, obviously voters can drop their completed ballot at designated drop-off locations and remain in their car. Uh, this method of voting proved to be safer for voters during the pandemic. Uh, it's been a while since my kids were in car seats, but I would imagine that uh, parents uh, with a voting age, uh, with, with children uh, in their car to avoid uh, waiting in those long lines uh, is well proved helpful. Can you speak to the benefits of drive-through voting outside of a pandemic uh, and share data or information about who used this type of voting in the last election? Absolutely. So right off the bat, we know that over 50% of people who use drive-through voting were Black, Latino, or Asian. And to be clear, we not only used it in the November 2020 presidential election, but the July and December elections as well, and most recently in May. And people love it. No matter what part of the city, no matter what their background, as you shared, being able to have your kid in the car while you vote means you don't have to call your kid out of their car seat and deal with the temper tantrum and risk that as you're trying to vote. But same with our seniors. We actually saw vans coming from uh, senior centers where people appreciated being able to sit in their cars, right, or their vans with the community they know and having easy voting access instead of having to get eight seniors in and out of a van sometimes that's cumbersome. We saw people with disabilities come and use it as well when curbside voting, which in Texas is mandated at every voting location, became sometimes too onerous because you could only have one voting machine there instead of the multiple that we were able to offer at drive through voting. So we know that um, beyond the pandemic, it's something that helps voters uh, vote and honestly gets them excited about voting again. Thanks so much. You mentioned temper tantrums, and I just remind you that you might hear from the uh, ranking member, Mr. Davis, uh, a little bit later uh, that will remind you uh, about that. Um, but um, wanted to ask this next question to Ms. Longoria uh, to, uh, and Ms. Uh, Marzani, um, and specific to Texas and Senate Bill 7. Um, uh, we, we heard you speak about this, Ms. Longoria, uh, restricting early voting hours, including Sunday mornings, uh, which have been utilized for souls at the polls initiatives, uh, prohibiting uh, drive through voting uh, and reallocating polling places using racially discriminatory formulas, um, amongst other restrictions. If drive through or curbside voting was restricted, what impact would this have on disadvantaged communities, including communities of color? Uh, and uh, a second question. Uh, is is uh, I'm the only litigator on our side. I'm the only person on our side, not a litigator. Um, so can you talk to me about the litigation, uh, why litigation alone is going to be inadequate uh, to challenge a law like SB7? Uh, Ms. Longoria to start and then Ms. Marzani. Absolutely. So uh, we know that over 170,000 people use drive through voting. Another uh, basically 15,000 or so use those late night and expanded hours. And so you're looking at literally hundreds of thousands of people who wouldn't have voted in November and wouldn't have voted in our May or December or July elections either. And so when we're looking at these impacts, if you cut these types of voting, you will affect the kinds of voting that we see other, you know, compared to early voting in person. Um, more communities of color, more people of color use methods that are easier, that are more accessible, and that quite frankly are just fun to use for voting, like drive-through voting, 24-hour, those curbside methods in our mail ballots. And uh, as an elections administrator, it's all good and well to say, well, you can take it to the courts, but I have to do elections in six months. I have to do elections today is early voting for me in another election. So I don't have six months to three years to wait for litigation to pan out. I need help today. Ms. Marziani. Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with all that. I mean, on litigation, you know, <laughs> to be sure, there will be litigation against the state of Texas if SB7 is passed. But litigation is resource intensive. It is long, it's onerous. And as the Honorable um, Isabel Longoria pointed out, um, elections will pass during that time and people will likely be disenfranchised. So that is not a solution. I might also point out that Curbside voting is a very particular type of voting. It is required under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Drive-through voting is much broader. So it, for, in, for instance, encompasses someone like me with two kids under five um, in the scenario that we discussed. And so that's one of the reasons it is so very important to expand participation. Thanks so much, Ms. Marziani and, and Ms. Longoria. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Aguilar. At this time, the chair recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Stile. Five minutes. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Langoria, uh, I see your, your current role is with the election administration. You're the election administrator for Harris County. Uh, how long have you been in that role for? Six months as the elections administrator and another year total working on elections in Harris County, and then 10 years so, working so, on elections so, and democracy here in Harris no, no, County. No, just, just, I, I only get five minutes, so I got to keep it tight here. So you were not the election administrator for Harris County at the time of the November 2020 election. Is that correct? I was the number three in the office. No, so, so you weren't, so you weren't the election administrator. You were obviously, obviously involved. I think that's, that's helpful for us to know. So is it, is it, you've never been the election administrator for an election previously. Is that correct? Uh, if you're asking about my resume, I can provide that to you. But yes, I do run elections here in Harris County and have been deeply involved but, for the past 10 years. But have you been an election administrator for, have you previously ever admit, been the administrator for an election in your career? Uh, no, everyone's got to start somewhere. So I started nope, six no, months no, no, ago no. as the elections administrator. Not a problem at all. Just want to make sure we're clear that previously you haven't had the opportunity yet. You will in the future. Uh, to be the administrator for election. I think that's important for the record as we understand you know, analysis of how we're doing this. Let me let me just dive in though for in Harris County. Um, last year, Congress appropriated $400 million in the CARES Act emergency funds uh, to states to assist with administering elections during a pandemic. And according to the EAC, uh, the state of Texas uh, received $24.5 million uh, in CARES Act funding. Do you know if Harris County received any portion of these funds? Uh, and if yes, how much? Sure, we received definitely funds from federal, state, and even our local partners to administer the elections and have since hosted four elections, or sorry, I'm sorry, but, two more elections but out with of the all of CARES Act funding out of the 25, roughly 25 million that Texas received. Do you know what Harris County received? I can get you that number, sir. That, that'd be great. Um, did Harris County receive funds for election administration from non-government sources uh, in 2020? Yeah, we work with tons of no, national uh, nonprofits and local nonprofits as well to host elections in a fair, accessible, and free manner here in Harris County. In, in, in particular, I, I believe Harris County received $9.6 million uh, from one grant uh, related to uh, ultimately uh, the, the, the donation of Mr. Zuckerberg. Is that correct? Uh, you've asked me that already. Yes, we receive funds from multiple nonprofits to host elections but, 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 but in Harris County for the presidential million, and others as well. And $9.6 million ultimately came uh, from Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, it paid for, my understanding is paid for grants, uh, including 24 hour polling locations, drive through voting, et cetera. Um, did, were some of these funds used to purchase ads on Facebook or any other social media platforms uh, to increase voting uh, turnout in Harris County? We use funds to educate voters about their methods yeah, but, and options yeah, for voting in Harris you. County. Yes or no, was, was, were some of those funds used to purchase ads on Facebook? Understood, sir. I'm just trying to provide context on yep. what we do in but, Harris County and, and you, why you we have follow, these methods of voting. With written remarks as you like, but were, were funds used for, for Facebook ads, yes or no? Uh, yes, as in every election. So, so, in, so some of the, the funds coming from Mr. Zuckerberg were ultimately used to purchase Facebook ads. I think it's relevant to know. Um, and was the grant solicited or unsolicited? Uh, what do you mean by that question? Did you solicit a, a grant from uh, ultimately from Mr. Zuckerberg's operation for the for the election? Uh, I mean, I, I want to be clear again. We we as a county do look to supplement the funds that we don't receive from you so, know state and federal you resources you solicit, to you host solicit free and fair elections. I'm just trying to answer your question, Representative. Understood. So you, the the county or the election administrators have solicited funds. Uh, from private parties in the past to to support the election operations. Of we don't County. solicit funds from private parties. Oh, you don't. Okay, you don't. You don't solicit funds from private parties. I, okay, let, let me just park this because we got limited time. I think it's interesting, uh, and maybe something this committee should look into about how private party funds are used. We've seen this in Wisconsin. Uh, we saw it in Milwaukee and Madison and Racine, Kenosha, Green Bay, um, and they shared about six point three million dollars. Uh, and some of that federal funding as well. And I, I think it's an opportunity for our committee uh, to examine how those funds were used. In my very short amount of time left, let me just shift gears. I'd like to just ask a quick question of Ms. Titus, uh, if I can. You've been very involved uh, in promoting elections. Uh, you've looked at how HR1, uh, in particular, I think, in how California has aspects of that. Um, some of the challenges that we'd see about unlimited ballot collection, collections uh, by third parties. Can you just comment briefly you, you spoke a little bit in your opening statement, just adding a little color to some of the challenges that we that you see, in particular in California, what would happen if we rolled that out nationwide? 
Well, first, as a general matter, I think it's interesting that HR1 proposes to nationalize certain standards. And in 2020, there were numerous counties in California that had to seek waivers from the state's laws um, to, because they simply couldn't comply with them or they didn't work for them geographically or demographically. And most of these were rural counties. And so it's often that these laws are written for more urban counties and urban voters and they leave out and really do not serve the voters of more rural counties. And so for that reason, I, I just don't think it's a good idea to have a system of laws where we have to constantly seek waivers and exceptions to those laws. And so that's as a general matter. And then more so, specific- So Ms. Tice, I, I would love to continue. I know we're gonna upset the chairman if I go way beyond my time. So I'm gonna hold you there. I'd look for you uh, to add some, maybe some color and some written statements at the end. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, in recognition of the time, I will yield back. I thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair recognizes Ms. Ledger Fernandez for five minutes. Thank you. Ms. Longoria, your testimony noted that Harris County had historic turnout due to innovations uh, that intentionally and successfully increased minority voting. You then set out eight ways in which you believe SB7, uh, as proposed by the Texas Republicans, was intended to impact minority low-income voting suppression laws. Now, I would note that as an election administrator and someone who helped administer elections in Harris County, um, you specifically called upon Congress to act. Um, so in thinking about how we can act, uh, let me ask you this. Do you believe that HR1 and a revised Voting Rights Act would protect minority voting access? I can't speak to all of the exact provisions in HR1 or the revised Voting Rights Act specifically, but I will say that yes, uh, as I've stated, we need federal intervention. Uh, I don't have time to wait for litigation to protect me in Texas. Uh, we obviously see that the Texas leadership uh, is not going to act in a way, uh, as they've stated in, in their own personal and public statements, right, uh, in a way that's going to help protect these innovations. And sadly, what we consider an innovation in Texas is standard practice in some parts of the country. And so I want to frame that as well, that though many parts of the country are, are good actors in doing what it, it takes to su uh, support voters uh, in Texas, we don't have that environment right now. And so that's why we need your help uh, at the congressional and federal level immediately. Thank you, Ms. Lingoria. Ms. Lang, your written testimony described how the 65 plus age requirements in Texas absentee ballot law especially hurt the Latino community. Can you describe why this is the case and if there are other examples of election laws with age requirements that disproportionately impact Latino or the minority voters? Yes, thank you very much for that question. Uh, so CDLC was involved in litigation about this particular issue uh, representing LULAC um, and the interests of the Latino community. Uh, what was particularly pernicious uh, was that the Latino community was facing these restrictions on vote by mail at a time when uh, the Latino community was suffering uh, from the effects of COVID-19, the worst in Texas. But at all times, these restrictions disproportionately affect Latinos because of the demographics in Texas. Um, it just is the case uh, that the Latino community um, and to a somewhat lesser extent, the black community in Texas um, are younger um, and that's well known. And so the white community um, is disproportionately older. And so um, older white uh, Texans had kind of free range to vote by mail while um, uh, Latino voters largely could not, even though they often lived in multi-generational homes um, and so they were putting at risk their older members. Uh, a number of other states have these types of age restrictions that on their face uh, perhaps look reasonable, but uh, underlying the demographics of age in our country um, lead to disproportionate effects on minority communities. Um, it is the case in many states uh, that Latino and Black communities uh, dispro are disproportionately younger uh, than white communities in states that have these type of rules. Thank you. I want to switch to uh, issues regarding Native American tribes. Uh, as my colleagues on the committee know, I've represented several Native American tribes before joining Congress. Uh, you shared that in 2018, a county recorder closed an early voting site for the Pascua Yaqui tribe in Arizona. And this meant that 4,000 voters on the reservation had to travel at least two hours round trip by bus to vote early. Uh, can you describe how the Shelby decision impacted the ability of Native American um, uh, to to vote? 
Absolutely. Uh, so this was just one example of many that we heard about earlier today on the first panel of closures that have affected minority communities. Um, and this one was particularly uh, problematic for the Pascua Yaqui tribe in 2020 uh, when they were trying to reduce uh, in-person voting on election day. Um, and an early voting location on the reservation would have um, made an enormous difference. Um, Native Americans face a lot of issues in, in Arizona in particular, but across the country of uh, longer uh, trips, uh, a lot of uh, polling places off reservation uh, that are not all only long distances away, but um, places where uh, Native Americans often feel unwelcome. Um, they are too often uh, not granted polling place locations on the reservation uh, where they can kind of uh, have uh, Native Americans uh, rep, uh, be the workers there and have a more welcoming community. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Daniels, you noted that protecting all, especially minority voting rights, is not a partisan issue. I agree with you. Restricting our citizens' right to vote is not partisan. It is un-American. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the November 2019 report, we vote, we count the need for congressional action to secure the right to vote for all citizens uh, by the Racial Equity Anchor Collaborative be added to the record. Without objection, the report will be received. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I yield. All right. At this time, the chair will recognize the ranking member of the full committee, my good friend, Rodney Davis. Thank you. Hey, thank you, my yes. friend, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Longoria, just real quick, uh, yes or no, I just want to make sure I heard something correctly because I don't have a lot of time either and I got to get some other witnesses. Harris County did not solicit any private funds from Mark Zuckerberg, correct? They were unsolicited? I think that's incredibly misleading, sir. Mark Zuckerberg was a part of a foundation and a nonprofit organization so that created no funds, funds for not. elections it administrators may, across the county. And so we were myself, able to okay. receive some funds from may that I, nonprofit. Mr. Chair, can I get some more time if I'm not able to get a simple yes or no answer? Did, did Harris County solicit this foundation money that Mr. Zuckerberg is part of, or did you not? Was it just given to you or did you solicit it? That's a simple answer. I, I'm, I'm unclear on what your definition of solicit is. We do have to, like all nonprofits, apply for funds. So you did solicit that money. Okay, that's what I just wanted to clarify. Because if I, you have to do an application, you solicited it, right? I Respectfully, it seems we disagree on the word of solicit. Oh, okay. Well, it, it is something I think the committee needs to look at whether or not funds are available to other rural communities and rural counties that may have some interest in, uh, in, in having outside funding help with their election administration, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't think it should be relegated to just uh, more populated counties in this country. Uh, now, I, I do wanna say to um, my colleague, or to Ms. Titus, uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for mentioning the ballot harvesting report, the California ballot harvesting report that the House uh, administration minority issued last Congress. Do you agree with the report's finding? Yeah, the interesting experience that we had in California in 2020, and I'm, I'm sure the members of the committee are aware of, I guess you could call it a controversy with the California Republican Party attempting to have its own um, drop box program is that when the California Attorney General got involved and um, as lawyers for the California Republican Party, we were on the phone with nine lawyers from the California Department of Justice and all of the questions seem to suggest that we should be following a number of protocols and safeguards that simply are not in the law. And while we didn't necessarily disagree with their implications, um, you know, they simply were not part of the law that was written, and yet they were intuitive. These were all safeguards that the lawyers on the phone seemed to think were the law, should be the law, and yet were not the law. And so California has this program that allows anybody to harvest ballots. Um, a union member could walk up to a colleague's door, demand their ballot, encourage them to vote in a particular way, political party operatives, um, could do the same. Um, there's really no requirement that somebody actually sign the outside of that person's ballot, that they tell the voter who they are, who they represent, whether they're being paid. Um, there's no receipt. There's no chain of custody. 
There are literally zero safeguards in the law, except that they not be tampered with and that they be submitted to the elections office within three days. Beyond that, the law has no requirements. And yet, while Democrats and union members were freely engaging in this activity without being harassed by state law enforcement, when the California Republican Party sought to implement it, and in fact went above and beyond the law uh, and the legal requirements, they were um, harassed by the attorney general's office as well as district attorneys and elections officials on Twitter. Um, one of our low level field staff had his life turned upside down and yet other candidates for Congress who happen to have a D after their name are not subject to the same harassment. Interesting, interesting to hear. Uh, speaking of California and statewide elected officials, um, according to information provided to us by the Secretary of State's office, former Secretary of State, now U.S. Senator Alex Padilla, used $34 million of, of uh, CARES Act funds that the state received to procure a contract with SKD Knickerbocker for the Secretary of State's Vote Save California initiative. According to the contract, the scope of work included get out the vote. As we all know is what GOTV services are, and know you you know they are. So SKD Knickerbocker's managing the director and senior strategist for the Biden campaign. Would you consider this a conflict of interest? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, not only did you have a a consulting firm that was working for uh, the Democratic presidential candidate. This firm was also working for a number of California Democratic congressional candidates. And yet they were hired by the state of California to perform this get out the vote program. We don't know which voters they were actually trying to get out, although we have our suspicions. And even worse, um, they had to cover their tails after the fact because it turns out they, they spent the money improperly and they needed to go back to the legislature months after they had committed these funds to SKD Knickerbocker, uh, months after the program had ended, and get the legislature to cure the fact that they really didn't have the appropriation to spend the money in the way that they spent it. It was intended and originally appropriated to be spent by counties, and the state essentially stole it from the counties and had to fix it after the fact. Well, thank you for your time. I'm, uh, thank you for your responses. I'm out of time. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the ranking member. This time the chair recognizes Ms. Scanlon for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to focus um, some of my questions on disability voting rights. Um, I'm, I introduced the disability voting rights bill, which was included in HR 1 and the Accessible Voting Act, both of which would help um, folks with disabilities, which include older Americans, veterans, et cetera, um, help, help them access and exercise their, their right to vote. Um, Ms. Longoria, currently, what are the options now for people with a disability to vote or register to vote in your jurisdiction? In Harris County, to register to vote, it all has to happen on uh, pencil with pen. Uh, even if you print your form online, you still have to do it with a wet signature. Um, folks with disabilities or maybe have physical impairments can get uh, assistance or witnesses to help them out, but there's no online voter registration. Uh, when it comes to voting, there's a couple of options. Curbside voting, so that is for every in-person voting location, we have to have a buzzer outside where someone can drive up, hit that buzzer, if they don't feel they can make it inside a location, and request that a machine be brought out to them. Um, we are happy to comply, but uh, as you can imagine, taking a machine from out from inside the location to bring it outside slows down voting, uh, both for the folks inside and outside, depending on how long the ballot is. Um, interestingly enough, too, Harris County, I think, is one of the few, if, if not the only county, still under preclearance with the DOJ, specifically for ADA accessibility. So we already have to go through a very limited preclearance, so uh, used to the paperwork, uh, to make sure that all of our voting locations have accessible ramps and accessible means of voting for those who can make it inside a voting location, uh, either with uh, an aid or not. And then drive-through voting, as was shared earlier, is available to everyone, including folks with disabilities or our older Americans, uh, which folks found extremely convenient to just drive up, not have to wait in lines to have machines brought in and out to you and to use to vote, um, whether you were there with your senior who had you know, a, a true handicap placard, for example, or something else. And mail ballot voting, of course. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting how um, when we pay attention to things like um, things that help folks with disabilities exercise their right to vote, 
it helps other people. Pennsylvania just put the voting, um, voter registration application online, just making it that much easier to get access to. And you know what? It was helpful to my college age kids to be able to print out that application and get it done. So, so we do see that the benefits um, extend beyond just perhaps that, that targeted population. Um, as, and the same, obviously, with the mail-in uh, voting. How did the most recent Texas legislative session threaten to impact voters with disabilities? In Senate Bill 7, which again was uh, stopped by a quorum, but has been threatened to bring back in a special session, we saw requirements in there for voter ID expansion to applications, which again, when you don't have online mail ballot applications, people would have to print out, scan, et cetera, all of their documents included in a piece of mail and send it in. Um, there were restrictions on who qualified as disabled to use mail ballot voting, uh, including um, people with certain illnesses taking them off. Uh, and then on top of that, putting even more restrictions on assistants or caregivers who would drive people to vote or to do mail ballot voting by having to fill out paperwork, step out the vehicle. So if you imagine uh, a senior living facility or an assisted living facility that brought a van of five people to come vote, um, then all of them would have to get out of the car while the person inside the car is voting and switch out who is allowed to be in the car if utilizing curbside voting. Wow, it's almost like people were trying to make it harder for certain groups of people to vote. Um, you know what, I don't have any further questions at this time, so I would yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The general lady yields back. This time the chair recognizes himself for five short minutes. Let me begin with you, uh, Professor Heron. Can you tell us a little bit more, please, about what your research says about the utilization of early voting by by minority voters voters racial racial minority voters uh just tell us what what your research says about the util utilization of early voting sure uh thanks for that question um so some states uh keep track of uh, the races of their voters races and entities and uh, my research uses that administrative data um to track when people vote uh, and what we can see is that, and this is found by other entrants in the literature as well, uh, that minority voters are disproportionately heavy users of early voting. Um, even within early voting periods, they're disproportionately often to vote on Sundays. We've already heard souls of the polls uh, discussed, um, and there's some evidence on weekends in general. Um, so I would say that's, that's the clear story here. Minorities vote very heavily on early voting. Thank you for that. Let me now go to uh, to Ms. Lang, if I may. Uh, Ms. Lang, in your voting rights litigation practice, to what extent have you seen jurisdictions restrict alternative options for voting, such as early voting and absentee voting in a discriminatory way? Unfortunately, we're seeing it more and more. Um, this is an area uh, where, again, as Professor Heron explained, um, because voters of color uh, are effectively using some of these mechanisms for voting, early voting and vote by mail, um, there have been increasing um, attempts to restrict access. Uh, so, for example, during uh, 2020, I mentioned uh, that uh, after Harris County uh, had already set up um, a number of early voting location, uh, drop box locations um, and early voting locations, uh, the um, governor suddenly announced that you could only have one drop box per county um, and uh, severely restricted access uh, to drop box services uh, and did so uh, right in the middle of the election we saw something similar in ohio of course this had the biggest effect um, on cities uh, that serve you know millions of people um, and can't do so with uh, one drop box effectively now, now, certainly, we all we all know that the Supreme Court has suspended the use of Section Five, but Section Two continues to be the law of the land, uh, and uh, it's being used very forcefully by some groups across the country. Uh, we're waiting to see what the Supreme Court's going to do in the Arizona case in the next few days, but but uh, we hope it will continue to be a very valuable resource. How how do you utilize the existing protections uh, that is Section Two in the Voting Rights Act to litigate? against discriminatory practices. Section two is absolutely critical uh, to my voting rights practice. Um, 
but there are obvious limitations to section two. Um, for example, uh, one of the most important section two cases I've ever litigated is the Texas voter ID case, uh, where the court uh, the courts held that that law was um, discriminatory under section two of the Voting Rights Act and therefore unlawful. The district court held that, a Fifth Circuit panel held that, an en banc panel of the Fifth Circuit held that, and the Supreme Court denied um, Texas's attempt to bring it up to the Supreme Court. And yet that discriminatory law was in effect um, from when Shelby County was decided until the 2016 election. For years, elections went by with a law that every federal court that saw it said was unlawful under Section 2 um, until 2016. 16 when we finally were able to get an injunction. Um, so section two takes some time and unfortunately, um, you know, can be eroded uh, with federal court interpretation. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing the Supreme Court's decision in Brnovich uh, this month um, and, and hope that the Supreme Court takes uh, the opportunity to strengthen section two since it is the only um, meaningful tool we have under federal law uh, to attack discriminatory voting laws. I certainly agree with you that uh, that we need to strengthen Section 2 and not weaken it. Uh, as a voting rights attorney many, many years ago, I tried cases using the intent standard. I tried cases using the results standard. And I can tell you that it's very difficult at times to, to prove what's in the heart and minds of those who, who prepare election systems, but we certainly know the, the electoral result. And so hopefully the Supreme Court will leave it intact. It appears that I am running out of time. And before I do so, I want to uh, ask unanimous consent, if I can, to add an October 12th New York Times article, which is titled, California Republican Party admits it placed misleading ballot boxes around state. Uh, which is related to documents pertaining to election fraud committed by the California Republican Party related to the related to ballot collection. Uh, I, uh, I have that in front of me. It's a New York Times article, and I ask that it be included in the record. Thank you. Without objection, it will be received. My time has expired. At this time, I will yield back the balance of my time. All right, Mr. Ranking Member, looks like we are winding down. Is there anything administratively that we need to take care of before we uh, before we close? I do not believe so on my end. All right. Let me close by first thanking all of today's witnesses for their very valuable testimony. Both panels have been just absolutely valuable, invaluable. Uh, thank you to the members for your questions as well. The members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for these witnesses, and if so, we will ask you to respond, that is the witnesses, to respond to those questions in writing. The hearing record will be open. It will be held open for those responses. And so, without objection, it's good to see all of you today, and thank you for your participation. Uh, the Subcommittee on Elections of the Committee on House Administration will now stand adjourned. We will see you next week.